All right. Well, welcome everyone. And we have more people entering. I can hear all the chimes as I speak. My name is Bernard Prusak and I'm the director of the McGowan Center for Ethics and Social Responsibility at King's College, which is in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania in the Northeast mm -hmm. corner of the state. I'm co-hosting this event together with my colleague, Harry Dammer at the University of Scranton. Harry's a professor of criminal justice and the Associate Dean of Arts and Sciences there. This event is doing double duty. So it's the first of nine Winter Spring McGowan Center events. They're all online and you're welcome to join us for each and every one. This event is also the first of 14 Winter Spring events in the series Catholic Higher Education in Light of Catholic Social Thought. Those 14 events will be hosted by eight institutions across the country. And I'd like to thank my co-organizer of those events, Jennifer Reed Booley of College of St. Mary for her work with me. Thanks also to you, Harry, for your collaboration. So let's do some nuts and bolts. Our principal speaker, I'm gonna leave it to Harry to say who that is. Our principal speaker will, give me one sec, present for about 25 minutes or so. And then our respondent will have around 10 minutes. They'll engage one another in discussion for let's say five minutes and then I'll reappear. So I'm going to serve as the moderator for the Q&A. To ask your questions, if you're new to Zoom, you wanna look at the bottom of the page, find the little chat box, send your questions to me. I'm one of the co-hosts, Bernard Prusak, and I'll do my best to introduce your questions into the mix. Okay, this event uh, is being recorded. I'll post it on the McGowan Center's Facebook page and also YouTube site. And I have all of your emails, whether you like it or not. So you're gonna hear from me again. I'll send a link to the recording probably tonight. If you happen to be able to unmute yourself, which shouldn't be the case, please don't unmute yourself. If you happen to be able to turn on the camera, which you probably can do, please don't turn on your camera during this event. So thanks again to all of you for joining us. I'm really looking forward to the presentation and discussion. And now I'm gonna to turn to Harry for the introductions. Thanks Bernard. Uh, would you like me to do uh, Jim first or Kathleen? Does it matter to you? Jim okay. first, he's the main event, Jim. Okay, okay. <laughs> That's very nice of you Kathleen to see you there. <laughs> Okay, Father, Jam Father James Heft of the Society of Mary has been a leader in Catholic higher education for over 40 years. He spent most of those years at the University of Dayton serving as professor, chair, dean, provost, university distinguished professor and chancellor. He left Dayton in 2006 to found the Institute for Advanced Catholic Studies at the University of Southern California where he now serves as the Alton Brooks Professor of Religion and founder and president emeritus of the Institute. He's written and edited 13 books and over 175 articles and book chapters. Most recently, he authored The Future of Catholic Higher Education, The Open Circle, which is coming out of Oxford University Press. In addition to his work about higher education, he also publishes in the field of interreligious dialogue. In 2011, Father well, Heft uh, was named by the Association of Catholic Colleges. They awarded him the Theodore Hesburgh Award for long and distinguished service to Catholic higher education. Kathy, you might know that Theodore Hesburgh guy. I don't know. Uh, Father Heft currently serves on numerous boards and committees, including the United States Catholic Bishops on Bishops Committee on Education. Maybe more important than his academic accomplishments, Father Heft was a two-time champion in the University of Dayton Intramural Basketball League, where he, dominated, where he dominated in the paint uh, as a result of a joint passing from a crafty New Jersey point guard, I might add. So welcome, Father Heft, and we're very happy to have you speak to us today. Dr. Kathleen Sprouse Cummings is the director of the Kushwa Center for the Study of American Catholicism at the University of Notre Dame. In addition to directing the center, she oversees the Conference on the History of Women Religious, the director of the Notre Dame sponsored project, um, Gender, Sex and Power towards a History of the Clerical Abuse in the Catholic Church. And in her free time, she's an associate professor of American studies. 
and, and affiliated with three, four different departments, including American Studies, History, and three others, where she teaches classes on a plethora of subjects related to Catholicism. She has published uh, co or published or co-edited four books and dozens of scholarly works. Her most recent book, A Saint of Our Own, How the Quest for a Holy Hero Helped Catholics Become American. And that was published in 2019. And she also serves as a media commentary on contemporary events in the church. Maybe more important than her academic accomplishments, she holds three degrees from the University of Scranton, including an honorary doctorate in 2019. And most important, really, she has she and her husband have three children. So welcome, Dr. Cummins, for today. Okay, Bernard, you can zap me if you want. We take it from there. So thanks a lot, Jim. Take it away. Thanks, Harry. I'd like to uh, thank everybody, uh, Bernard and Harry and Kathleen, for participating in this. Um, it is a big and it's an important topic. Um, recruiting presidents, board of trustees, members, and so on, it's, it's, a, it's an art, not a science. Um, you can make a lot of mistakes. I've made some of them myself, only to discover after interviews and references and so on uh, that it just wasn't what it appeared to be. So there's a real challenge here. Um, I want to actually talk about five things. One is the times that we live in, um, sharpened differences and new challenges. I wanna say something about the typical background, at least in my experience of board members. The third, a distinctive nature and mission of Catholic higher education. Fourth, uh, social teaching and how that could affect the distinctiveness of Catholic higher ed. And then finally, uh, choosing a president, some immediate issues, some long range issues and so on that I think might be helpful. But, but before I start, I wanna do a, uh, some preliminary cautions. Like, if you remember, I think it was Mark Twain who made the comment, no generalization is worth a damn, including this one. And there are really, it's difficult to make a lot of generalizations that really hold in every instance for Catholic higher education. There are huge differences. For example, in terms of student bodies, there are some that only work with, with uh, undergrads, others with undergrads and grads, some mainly non-traditional students and so on. There are different locales. Uh, a university or a college that's in a major metropolitan area faces certain challenges that one that is not located in that, maybe a small town, a kind of university or college town, very different in that way. Um, there's a huge difference in endowments. There are four Catholic universities at the present time that have endowments of $1 billion or more. Two of those are in the $2 billion range and one is in the $10 billion range. And there are many Catholic and colleges and universities that don't have a hundred million. Um, and this is uh, this makes a great difference in trying to think about future and all of that. And then there are different different visions of Catholicism. I'll come back to this, but, but uh, there are some that will pride themselves in a certain vision of conservative Catholicism, others that, that have a more elastic version of Catholicism, and sometimes they don't view each other with very friendly eyes. And, and finally, I would say, you know, Catholic higher education in the United States could be described as a free enterprise kind of system, a lot of competition, you know, not with the top and the bottom, but in between segments where there's a, a kind of inequality. There are even competition among Jesuit universities for professors, for Jesuits competing, offering a better prize and so on. Who would have thought? So I, I'll make some generalizations. The key is going to be how they might apply to the particular institution that you're a part of, assuming that you are or have responsibility for as a, either a faculty member, or an administrator, or a board member. The first point is to mention briefly uh, the obvious. This is the first two points are basically an effort on my part to diagnose as honestly as I can the lay of the land in the United States as I get around, less this past year, of course, but I, I get around quite a bit to different places. So first two points, diagnosis. And I think it's a very important part of, of actually trying to figure out what can what you should do. If, if, if you've misdiagnosed, you can 
mess up everything after that. So there are sharpened differences. I mean, you don't have to go through the past week and a half to realize that there are some really deeply held differences in the country. How much of the population identifies with that difference? I think the media does a, a good job of focusing on some, especially if it's controversial or, or, or um, some type of a, a explosion. And I think a lot of times uh, we speak of a flyover zone. There's a flyover zone of a lot of people in the United States who are just kind of perplexed by the whole thing. Um, so we also have a diversity that has emerged rather clearly in, in the Bishop's Conference. Um, their election statement this past year said that abortion was the preeminent issue. At the same time in the document, they said that Catholics are not single issue voters. Well, you can't say both without confusing. And then bishops went ahead and on their own made statements that appeared to be very highly partisan. So we had this kind of a bridge. Second, I, I think also as part of the diagnosis is that we have a number of uh, the secular liberal press really loves to highlight the bishops opposition to Democrats. Whereas they often ignore the opposition that, that presidents that bishops have shown to Republican presidents. There have been any number of statements under the Trump administration by the American Bishops Conference on the death penalty, immigration, healthcare, DACA, but they don't get into the press. So you have to be very careful there. And we know in Catholic networks, we have a wide range. You could call them, I don't like the terms, but liberal, conservative, and so on. There is also another um, challenge but I think also an opportunity, and I'll come back to this, but I wanna mention it here. There are fewer and fewer members of religious congregations that have founded 90% um, of the Catholic colleges and universities in the United States. I remember taking a look at um, Peter Steinfeld's book published in 2005, and he made the statement that lay leaders come with new questions, lay leaders of Catholic colleges and universities with new questions, but not with much of the old wisdom. I'm not sure that's as true today as it was before um, because that transition was only in the beginning stages. I think presently over 50% of Catholic colleges and universities are led by lay people and that number is surely to go up. Um, and very often I think religious orders have done, um, not necessarily done themselves a service when they have assigned a mission officer who doesn't have much academic standing. Um, so that the influence that that person could have on a faculty, which is most, most important, is limited. Um, or on boards of trustees, they want to put the religious who might be serving on the board of trustees in the mission committee and leave them there. I think the mission committee, we should work very hard to have lay people leading that and, and have them uh, grow in that understanding of, of uh, fiduciary responsibility. The transition from the 1950s to the present in Catholic higher education, of course in the church overall, huh, has been enormous. You can't underestimate the difference. I'll give you one example. I was looking at a yearbook from Holy Cross College. I think it was, it was the late 40s, maybe 1947, 40, 49. I have a friend out here in LA who was a graduate then who's recently deceased, but in that, 70% plus of the faculty were all Jesuits, 70%, including the School of Business and so on. That exists nowhere today, nowhere. So it's been a huge shift in how to manage it, how to work it, how to make the transition of those things that are non-negotiables and keep them really strongly, but be open to innovation is the challenge of the times. I think also the challenge when people are under great financial stress, there's pressure for them to find marketable degrees. And they're often in ones that have a commercial character to them. And I will argue that one of the most important dimensions of a Catholic college and university's mission are the liberal arts. Um, but I don't think that only the humanities can communicate or be taught as a liberal art. I think it's possible even for engineering to be taught as a liberal art. More about that later if you want. And then there's also the challenge of fewer and fewer of our students and faculty come to us with a 
rich Catholic background. Um, so I, I, I think that's that's really a problem. On the other hand, I have found it to be also, if not an advantage, it's 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 pretty tough when they come with a chip on their shoulder. A number of people come maybe with some info, information from the media, but they find out that Catholicism is a lot richer, a lot broader, and a lot deeper than they had imagined. And sometimes these people without much religious background can become key players in the mission of a Catholic university. And finally, in this first point, the secularization has taken place. I won't go into the various sociological analyses of it, but, but one thing for sure is that families have had a harder time passing on the faith to their children, the growing number of young adults who don't affiliate anymore. And, and I think uh, that even those that have been raised in Catholic schools, high schools and so on, often have very little knowledge of Catholic social teaching. It's a very striking kind of thing. Part of that may be because of the emphasis that the bishops have put on more doctrinal matters that are more easily and clearly defined, assuming perhaps issues of morality um, and sexuality that have been emphasized so strongly. Let's look for a second at the second point, the typical background of lay board members. Typically, they come from the top 5% of the income wealth distribution, top 5%. They have corporate experience. Uh, they tend to be politically conservative. Um, they uh, have an affection for their alma mater. They almost a very high percentage have a background in business, MBAs, so on. So there's a way in which they love the university, but a number of them, even though they went through it, through a university, may not really understand a university very well. Um, it's also the case that many board members have difficulty understanding tenure. You know, uh, why would you keep somebody whom you find to be disruptive or find somebody who's not quite carrying their weight and so on? There are some questions here that are real, but I think tenure, a good argument can be made for it. Faculty governance can also become difficult for corporate mindset to understand. And then finally, one of the major issues that cuts across not just boards of trustees, but uh, it, it's this is everywhere, like the virus almost. The difficulty people have in understanding Catholicism as an intellectual and moral tradition. They, they picture it as a parish. They can understand campus ministry and the sacraments, but understand that Catholicism has something deep to contribute to all the disciplines, all the disciplines. That is, I think, the pearl of great price that has to be discovered. Um, so I think also the case faculty tend to be somewhat naive about finances, in my experience, and the challenges at high levels of administration, the kind of multiple kinds of things you have to balance uh, when you're trying to run a university. I used to, I mean, I was trained as a historian and a theologian. I thought I had a liberal education, but my real liberal education came when I was provost. And that was a liberal education because I had school of engineering, school of law, school of business. I had a research institute, $200 million going on there. That forced me to think more broadly than I had ever thought before. So first two points, times, sharpen differences, second, typical background of board members. Let me go to the third point, the distinctive nature and mission of Catholic higher education. A couple of years ago, I had the privilege of being part of a, a celebration of Bo Boston College's uh, anniversary um, of founding. And at that time, they did a survey with the Association of Catholic Colleges and Universities of presidents of all Catholic colleges and universities. And one of them, one of the questions was, how do, you, um, how do you think about the mission of a Catholic university? And then they asked the next question and they gave several groups within the university. Uh, how, what degree of support do you find for the Catholic mission? Um, and you found out that the vast majority of presidents thought that the faculty was the least supportive. Now that can boggle your mind. Now, 
what could that mean? That might be worth just putting there. But they didn't even define very well what Catholic mission was. It would have helped if they had said, here's the Catholic mission, and then asked them to comment about it, but that wasn't done. There's also the case that, uh, as I said before, Catholic mission is wider than philosophy and theology. Uh, we used to have 18 credit hours, huh? Uh, in, in sometimes in, in philosophy and in theology. And some people regret that that was, uh, has been whittled down to in most places to six hours and so on and so forth. I think it's important to realize, I mean, I, I have my interest. I'd love to see more courses in theology and, and philosophy. However, there are other fields that can be taught in such a way as to really strengthen the Catholic mission. I'm thinking of literary studies. I'm thinking of language studies. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking of, of engineering and sustainability. You know, uh, um, I'll come to the business schools in a minute where things could be taught and could be written. Otherwise, what happens is they often, faculties often kind of download the Catholic mission on campus ministry and those courses that are required in theology and philosophy. And that's not always a good bet either. It depends on what philosophy and what theology is being taught and how it's being taught. So this is, the, this is a, a part of the distinctive mission that we have to tackle. I think that one of the things that Catholicism and its mission can show is that most of this argument about the division between science and religion, I always ask my students, so they say, well, what about science and religion? I say, well, what do you mean by science and what do you mean by religion? And it's always like, well, you know, whatever. And it's usually what they're talking about in the United States, at least is um, certain claims of science about evolution that could be godless, all right? That's a problem for a Catholic. And then religion is almost always conservative or even fundamentalist Christianity. It's rare that you see Catholicism in opposition to something like science as such. I just saw that Bishop Barron is hawking a book. I just ordered it. I think it'd be quite good for middle school kids, giving 25 examples of real prominent Catholic thinkers over history that contributed to science. That's very important and a very good thing. I also think that one of the missions of a Catholic university is to do something to demonstrate the important link between academic freedom and authority. I think a lot of times academic freedom is perceived as almost total independence within the context of one's discipline. I think Catholic universities need to be able to show that academic freedom is important for individual professors, and it's also important for the university as a whole. The university has to have a certain freedom itself to be distinctive. Now, there'll be conflicts. There usually are, but both types of academic freedom need to be emphasized as important and negotiated in ways that sometimes can be critically difficult. I think a lot of faculty have trouble picturing a school of business as consistent with Catholic social teaching. We'll come back to that. I do think that one of the most important dimensions that any college or Catholic university can work on is the core curriculum. Core curriculum. And, and it, <clears throat> I have seen so many turf wars. Core curriculum, who's, who's going to have fewer credit hours in that curriculum and so on and so forth. Those are battles that have to be fought, <clears throat> but the core curriculum really carries the mission of the institution. I think finally, it would be important uh, to keep in mind what we mean by the education of the whole person. We use that term all the time. In fact, secular liberal arts colleges use it too. So one of the gaps that I often perceive now in Catholic colleges and universities is the gap between the faculty and campus ministry. In the old days, it was a lot easier to keep them together because most of the faculty were religious. It didn't necessarily ensure high quality academics, but the link was there. Now it's almost divided. And uh, I think that if we can rethink that in such a way that we realize that the intellectual work has moral consequences and the moral life can be enriched by the intellectual, that would be a great achievement for Catholic colleges and universities. For example, learning how to love has epistemological consequences. There's some things you never understand 
unless you love, or if you do not believe, you will not understand. You've heard that in the Catholic tradition, that's important. So difficult times, typical background of board members, the distinctive nature and mission of the university. How about Catholic social teaching? My fourth point, Catholic social teaching, I would say, first of all, ever ancient, ever new. And to think that this only started with Leo the 13th in 1891 or something with Rerum Novarum, I think you're missing a whole tradition within Catholicism. Concern for the poor, care for the poor. It's embedded in the teaching of Jesus. It's in the New Testament. And the response in the early church were hospitals, places of, of hospitality, welcoming the stranger. The religious orders, the many religious orders at the beginning of the life of the church demonstrated this kind of openness to the people that were vulnerable and hurting and so on. It is true <clears throat> that by the time you get to the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, with Leo XIII and others, more and more popes began to realize that there was a real responsibility to say something about human dignity in the marketplace and the way they were being treated by corporations and so on and so forth, the right to unionize and so on, that more of what might be called modern forms of Catholic social teaching began to develop. The key principles, they should be familiar to all of you, the dignity of the human person. I believe if that's not rooted transcendentally, if that's not rooted in God, then that dignity can be viable. It can be attacked. And we have too much history to prove that. The option for the poor, the question of the common good, it's highly controversial. Republicans talk about the common good. Democrats talk about the common good. And you realize the common good is not common. So how Catholics can begin to articulate the common good, you do it best through Catholic social teaching. Issues of justice, not just charity, justice. I remember, what was that TV show? Undercover Boss, Undercover Boss, where they would disguise the top CEO and he would go and work at the lower levels of the big company and be shocked by what the, the, his laborers had to work with and so on. At the end of the show, he would, uh, remove his disguise, he would call a couple of these laborers that he met on the ground floor, called to his office, they were shocked. And then he was very kind. <clears throat> I remember one show where they gave him a, a car, another one they needed tuition for two of their children, he did all that. I never saw one single show where he changed the structure of the company so that it was more just and more fair in terms of wages and work expectations and so on. So. Another thing that I think is important is immigration, universal health care coverage. Remember, universal health care coverage, the American bishops say, even for undocumented immigrants. Now, these, these are dimensions of Catholic social teaching that a lot of people would just raise their hand and say, this is crazy. This is crazy. How can you do this? It sounds like the Democratic Party at prayer. This is ridiculous. Um, but what if it's rooted in the dignity of every human person in the image, created in the image and likeness of God. We see now in the LA area, many of the hospitals, the more regional hospitals, especially those in South Central LA, the poorer regions don't have equipment. The number of deaths of minorities, blacks and Hispanic, Hispanics, two to one compared to whites. Somebody has got to ask question, why is this? What is the common good? Where does this come together? I think one of the things that needs to be understood is that faculty governance is the principle of subsidiarity. The faculty should have the ability and the trust to be able to develop the curriculum. That's what they should do. Doesn't mean that the board wouldn't have anything to say, but that is subsidiarity. Another one is solidarity. What about the school of business? 20% of all degrees awarded annually in this country or in the School of Business. You locate with just, let's say, theology, the mandatum for theologians. I'm not against that, I have one. That's not a problem for me. Rogue bishops are problems for me. But the, the, the mandatum is not a problem. The problem is if 20% of the graduates take School of Business courses and there's no effort to try to focus on Catholic social teaching you know, even just to ask in an economics course, what is the impact on the poor? 
You don't have to prescribe what it should be or should not. Just ask the question regularly. I think that would make a huge difference. We gave Avery Dulles a, uh, an honorary degree once. He was very solemn, very up on the podium while all the students were getting their individual degrees. And, and there were about, I think there were, at that particular time, there were about five theology majors that got to Every one of them, he, he clapped. I, I, I was sitting next to him, it shocked me. I was going, and finally, when the last one got it, and he goes, and then he went back into his coma. And I said to him, I said, wait, he says, you got to root for your own. You got to root for your own. There aren't many of us. Got to think about that. Catholic social teaching, is it the best kept secret? I don't think, I don't think that's a good way to phrase it. I, I, I think it means that people know it, but they're keeping it quiet. I think a lot of people don't even know it. And part of the reason they don't know it is it's not taught in a lot of seminaries. It's not a part of homilies for fear of being divisive, given all that stuff I said at the beginning. But I do think it's, it's a profound resource for rethinking a lot of things in our country and in the world in a way that would make a real difference. Caution, do not underestimate the difficulty and the challenge of trying to implement more of a Catholic social teaching intellectually within a Catholic university. There'd be a lot of people of wealth who will say this is socialism, this is dangerous, why are you doing this? I would just wanna say that I think this is, a, a, this is at least a 25 year process. It takes a lot of patience, a lot of time and a lot of work. I did a lot of faculty seminars that lasted a year long with people and it takes time, it takes face time, it takes money to do it. But I think the consequences are really good. I'm not talking about a Benedict option, you know, where we would become a little um, cohort kind of shielded from the world. My, my vision is the open circle. You need a circle. You need a kind of embodied sense of the mission, but it remains open, welcoming, interacting, and so on with people of different perspectives. Fifth and last point, after the divisions, after looking at the typical background of board members, distinctive nature, and then Catholic social teaching, a few remarks and I will stop. Choosing the next president. I think it was St. Augustine who said somewhere, no small part of discovery is knowing what you're looking for. Um, in the short term, an institution might be in, 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 in financial crisis. And if it's in danger of closing, it needs to have a president who understands finances within a Catholic university and its mission. And to hire someone that has that special skill, maybe not necessarily the Catholic intellectual tradition, could be understandable for a short-term response to a very difficult thing. Or maybe the difficulty is division between faculty and administrators or something. Or maybe it's a division with a local bishop. That doesn't have to be the key thing, but it could be a factor in choosing a president who would have some smarts about how to handle that question. It's also the question of what do you need in the long term? I would argue in the long term, what we constantly need is the distinctiveness of Catholic higher education. Otherwise, you know, when it comes to state universities, they're subsidized by the government. We're charging four or five times as much. And if we download Catholic identity onto campus ministry, and there's a good campus ministry at the state university, why go to a Catholic university? It's too expensive. It doesn't really deliver anything that would be different in all the courses, except maybe theology and philosophy. I think also a president needs to, to understand that the capacity to deal with multiple audiences. The, the further you get up in administration, the more that that's the case. Some people say, some faculty diehards will say, well, that you're selling out, you know, you're, you're no longer academic, so on. It takes an academic sharpness to figure out how to deal with multiple audiences. And they include not just the faculty, but students, parents, donors, bishops, and the press. The press, how do you deal with the press? That's an art. And some people, you know, just antagonize. Uh, and, and, and that's not really very helpful for any institution. Another thing is, I think you need to judge what are the strengths already in the university. So for example, if you have a provost who really gets it and is committed to the institution, 
understands the mission, it's not as critically important that the president understand that mission as well, as long as they walk and talk together a good deal. Um, I would also say mentoring of the new president by board and by faculty. I think more board members need to meet faculty because I don't think enough of them understand what the faculty do. And I think that would be important. I think more fundraising people need to sit down and talk with faculty because very often they talk to donors, but they don't really know how to showcase the gifts of the university academically. And that would be important. I think lay leadership, um, there are still some religious orders I think that are clinging to the control of their place. And I think they'd be a lot wiser to be able to open up to talented men and women, the leadership, and provide perhaps terrifically important supporting roles. Perhaps being teachers, but at the same time, spending a lot of time with students in the way that they're needed. This is particularly true in undergraduate level. To the extent a place has a commitment to graduate level education, that's a little more complicated kind of dance. So I think a lot of time spent in terms of formation. So we live in an age of sharp distinctions, even divisions. I gave a little bit of a background of typical board members, but board members learn and they change and that gets rich. Distinctive uh, mission of a Catholic university, some of the challenges and benefits of Catholic social teaching, what a powerful tool that is, and then finally choosing the next president. That's it. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you, Jim. I've uh, learned so much from you uh, for over many years, and uh, this afternoon is just continuing that. So it's a, a pleasure to, to see you uh, in this format and to hear your thoughts. I am uh, also very grateful. Kathy, to hear... Kathy yeah? I'm going to interrupt. Would you turn yeah. on your camera too, please? We're not seeing you. We're just hearing you. It is, it is on. I can see it. I can see yeah, my... I can see it too. Bernard, maybe you're hiding non-video participants. Can everyone else see me? Now well, I can no, see you. Sense. You're good. I can okay. see you. I think you're fine. Go on. Sorry for the interruption. That's okay. No, it's important to be seen. Hopefully everyone can see me now. Well, and I was uh, about to thank you for organizing this conversation. As you'll see, this is uh, something I think is very important to bring as many of us from as many different places into one space, uh, virtual though it is, to, to think through these issues. Jim, my comments, my follow-up questions are organized around three juxtapositions. Uh, the first one is, let's say, confession and charism, uh, or, or Catholicism and charism. Another way to say it might be cooperation versus competition. Almost exactly a century ago, and at this point, Bernard is getting nervous, wondering why he invited a historian to comment on this, and I promise I won't stay in the past for very long. Um, but almost exactly a century ago, a visionary uh, Catholic women's college leader named Mary Malloy from the College of St. Teresa in Winona, Minnesota, gave a talk at the Catholic Educational Association meeting where she was concerned about what was called the proliferation of Catholic women's colleges. At the time, there were about 15 Catholic women's colleges, but there were many, many more being talked about for lots of reasons, uh, a big part of which was the fact that many states were requiring teachers to have college degrees and Catholics were teaching. Um, there were all sorts of reasons, but Mary Malloy proposed that instead of having every Catholic women's religious order build their own college, that perhaps it might be wise to think strategically about combining resources and opening several large regional colleges for Catholic women that would be sponsored by multiple religious congregations. Uh, this proposal went nowhere. I remember um, it, talking to my teacher and, and colleague, Philip Gleason, about this and him saying, Kathy, that would have never gone anywhere. That was, uh, there's no way that those, all of those congregations could have cooperated because they were so invested in shaping their members in their own charism. There was competition that was fueled, stoked by many bishops who of course needed the labor of those women. Um, 
So there were many reasons why it would not have happened. And I'm not suggesting that it's a, a good plan for today. I do wonder if it was an instructive moment because looking back, you see those words of Mary Malloy and that plan to be more creative in sharing resources and look at what happened. Almost every Catholic women's religious congregation founded their own college, led to uh, hundreds of Catholic women's colleges when you factor in the junior colleges. And perhaps had they thought more strategically about it in the face of all the challenges that would have been required in doing so, perhaps they would have weathered the massive changes that came later in the 20th century. And perhaps there would be more Catholic women's colleges in existence today. I offer that moment just briefly as a, a springboard to think about acknowledging what you said so eloquently, our differences were different constituencies, different sizes of endowments, different visions of Catholicism. We compete with each other for students, but for resources. To what extent are we all in this together? Or to what extent should we be in this together? To what extent can we be true to our own institutional histories, our own respective charisms, um, and yet support Catholic higher education in its broadest sense? And I think this conversation, and, and that's being done, of course, in various ways. Can we do more? And, and again, it's why I'm so excited to be part of this conversation. Can we think creatively about given our differences and given the way we compete with each other, are there ways we could share more resources and be more supportive according to proportionality? As you mentioned, we have different size endowments. And frankly, I think the University of Notre Dame could do more uh, to support Catholic education more broadly. Those that have more should be giving more. Um, what would it mean to think about articulating a distinctive charter for Catholic higher education in the modern world, a revisiting of Land O'Lakes, um, certainly not calling it Land O'Lakes, it's, it's too fraught, but that idea that, that Father Hesburgh and many others were doing in 1967 saying the world has changed, Catholic education is, has changed. And what are our guiding principles? You've given us a lot to think about there in terms of Catholic social teaching, our distinctiveness from state universities. Um, is that even possible to think about how we could sit down and articulate um, what the defining principles will be, recognizing that we have lots of differences. So just that first point, how do we um, think about the big picture and cooperate even as we compete and we come from different visions and charisms? And by the way, uh, just in case you think this is an impossible task, this is something I've started to do in my Catholic history classes at Notre Dame. We read the Land O'Lake Statement. Um, they read it. Of course, students had usually have never heard of it and they enjoy reading it. And as one of our final assignments, we go back and say, should this be rewritten? And actually we, they do it. Uh, they go through each of the principles and talk about which ones are um, not as relevant today, which ones need further thought and uh, they do it, it's an assignment. So I think if our undergraduate students can have fruitful conversations, surely uh, we can as well. And we do need to look past some um, some differences that we have. So that's the first one. My second juxtaposition is uh, board and faculty. And you've said so much of this so beautifully. I have been a faculty member at the University of Notre Dame um, since 2001. Um, in the last two years, I've been a member of the Board of Trustees at the University of Scranton, which I've learned so much. Um, I have to say my interactions as a faculty member at Notre Dame with Board of Trustees members, and I've done that um, on occasion when I've been invited to make a presentation to them. These are very fraught affairs. They're highly curated. Uh, there are inevitably multiple members of the president's office, staff members, um, reading my comments in advance, coaching me, telling me, you know, giving me the lay of the land. These are not, uh, I, I have enjoyed them, but there are not times when I'm interacting, was interacting with, with board members in a way that didn't feel very high stakes. So I think when you say find opportunities for board members to meet faculty um, in a way that's not just dropping in and giving a short presentation, but to really understand what it is we do, I think that's a wonderful idea. At the same time, I've learned more being on the board of the University of Scranton for two years about higher education than in all my years at Notre Dame. As you say, the complexities, um, the, the 
the stakes, the different constituencies, faculty members, as we know, very easy to get wrapped up in our own things. Um, many of my fellow board members are in this audience and they become um, just very good friends. Uh, we've worked with many of them on committees and uh, it's just, it's really been a wonderful opportunity for me. And I suppose, you know, I, I would like to hear your thoughts on one, how could we create more low stakes interactions between board and, and faculty members um, that's not at that cocktail party at the board of trustees meeting or not at a 10 minute presentation? Are there seminars that we could be in together um, learning together, thinking together, and trying to understand each other. And I suppose, too, I, I think it's, it's fairly unusual on many boards to have a faculty member on the board, and, and for reasons that I think you said about the income um, of typical board members. So I guess this is just a, a, a plea to remember that there's um, time, talent, and treasure that many alums and uh, constituents are willing to give. And it might not, the treasure we might not be able to give, but there are certainly many faculty members who'd be willing to give of their time and talent as board members. So is there a way we can think more uh, creatively about that? Again, it's been tremendously eye-opening and fulfilling to me to be on my alma mater's board. And um, I, I just wish I, I had known more about the inner workings of it sooner as a faculty. It's made me a better faculty member, frankly. Uh, my final juxtaposition is, uh, let's say, clerical and lay, and you've already talked about this uh, quite a bit, and an important subset within that, which is uh, men and women. So I'd love to hear you reflect on how we might all navigate what I see as a very fine line between, on the one hand, honoring the charism and the legacy of the founding congregation, leveraging what Steinfels called the old wisdom of the congregation on the one hand. And on the second hand, avoiding the temptation to accentuate clerical privilege in a way that can be harmful um, and certainly not empowering to lay leaders at the university. But I think just in terms of where we are in the church, we're learning about uh, the, what the devastations that can be caused by clerical privilege. Um, so I, I think that's a fine line. Uh, how do we honor that legacy and, also, and, and, and give members of the founding congregation those, those privileges without reinforcing them in ways that might not be helpful. And along those lines, uh, I think we need to consider that when we privilege clerics, we privilege men. An obvious statement, but one that I can remember the moment this hit home to me. I was on um, a visiting committee, um, an external review committee at Harvard Divinity School a couple of years ago. And uh, you know, our job was to assess everything and hear from everybody. And it was Drew Gilpin Faust last year as president of Harvard. And so over the course of the several days we spent there, we heard so much about her leadership and how energizing it was. And in our final conversation, I made what I thought was an offhand comment about how gratifying that was to see as a, as a historian of women and as a woman myself, how uh, empowering that had been to not just women on the campus, but to all people on the campus to have a female leader. And I said, it was particularly instructive coming from a place where we will never have a woman president. And I, I just kind of threw this comment out there and people, I was the only representative of a Catholic institution in the room and people just like, everybody got silent. They said, what are you talking about? And I said, oh, well, I'm at the University of Notre Dame and in our bylaws, it stipulates that the president will be a member of the founding congregation. And that means he will be a Holy Cross priest. And that means that there will be no women. And it just, the, the people were like kind of blown away by that reality. And I had, you know, I had just taken it for granted. And it was the first time that I thought, well, sure, there are lots of places that haven't had a female president. But there are very few places that remain that at this point in their bylaws, they, it is not possible to have a female president. And I just wonder if this reality acts as a deterrent to women who might otherwise seek leadership roles in Catholic colleges and universities, even ones that do have open searches for presidents. I just like you to reflect on that. And then to loop back to my first comment, when I have my students uh, revisit Land O'Lakes and think about principles, one of the first things they notice is that there were no women at Land O'Lakes <laughs> and there are no women signatories. And I do think that many of the leaders of Catholic women's colleges are ahead of uh, Catholic 
colleges founded by the male congregations on a lot of these issues because they've had to be, because they dealt with these challenges a lot sooner than the rest of us did. So I'll close there. Again, thank you. And I look forward to hearing uh, your thoughts and more questions. Well, um, <laughs> Kathy, uh, you've lived up to your reputation. These are not easy issues. Um, two things about the first one briefly. Uh, I'm a Marianist. Uh, 25 years ago in a general chapter, they listed five characteristics of Marianist education like, you know, education and faith and community and blah, blah, blah. And I've watched over the years how these have been kind of subsumed into the culture rather than being distinctively rooted in the Catholic tradition. So I wrote up five characteristics of Catholic education. And my argument was that Catholicism as an educational enterprise preceded the Marianists by hundreds and hundreds of years. And that is more important than the distinctive charism, right? It doesn't mean the charism doesn't have a role. The role of a charism is to give a distinctive inflection of that great tradition. Because if it's just the great tradition, it's harder to get a hold of. But when you say, well, it's the charism of this group or that group, you begin to see it a little more concretely. And that's a valuable thing. But I think we should never um, pit the two against one another or so emphasize one like the charism as though the deep and broad way that we could come together catholicism itself uh, is lost from sight um, another uh, dimension that i would say is you mentioned a competition i don't know what to do about that frankly because i remember reading in in uh, bill Leahy's book uh, about the idea of the Jesuits in the 1930s, they were said, you know, we don't have enough resources to do a competitive graduate school. So why don't we combine all of our efforts and resources just on the graduate level? And they, in their conversation, they came to, it was gonna be St. Louis University. It fizzled, it died. They, it's so deeply ingrained in us as Americans, this kind of individual enterprise. Will it ever happen? Uh, I don't know. I think one of the reasons religious orders want to guard their, their own enterprise and charisms is their life, their recruitment, and their future. If you start going together with everybody else and you run the risk of, you know, you lose your distinctiveness, some you know better than most, some of the women that go into a men's college, it isn't long before the men's college pretty well takes it over. So how do you keep that distinctive identity? It's not easy. I haven't answered your question, but I've tried to describe some aspects about it. Board and faculty, lots of avenues for that. And we, we did a number of these at UD that I thought were really helpful. Remember, UD is 12,000 students. It's not a small place and so on. But having faculty uh, welcome board members to their classes, and not just the safe ones. I mean, I have a Muslim professor. I always wanted them to go visit, you know? Um, sometimes on committees, I think it's really important to have a village atheist. Now there are atheists and they're atheists. I'm talking about religious atheists. There are atheists that are pissy. They just don't like religion. They, I, I don't want them. If I had an atheist like Camus, I would, I would hire him on my university faculty. Not in theology, but I would hire him because it would be a gift. So getting uh, board members to interact with people at that level, I think it's great. Visit classes, talk to people not in the board meetings. That's where everything, you're absolutely right. It's tense, the decision's gotta be made, it's crazy. Um, it's, like, it's like departmental meetings. I sent to, I'm, I'm in the Department of Religion here and I sent an email to a woman who's the chair of the department, she's wonderful. And I said to her, you know, this COVID being cooped up has been so bad, I'm even at the point where I'm looking forward to a departmental meeting. <laughs> Ridiculous, how could this happen? The clerical lay thing, a couple of things here that might be interesting. As a historian, you know better than I, the long uphill battle. I mean, when uh, Sister Madaliva wanted to have graduate education, not just her, but many people, women wanted to have graduate education in theology for their sisters, they were turned down by many Jesuit universities, Notre Dame included, they were turned down. So she founded her own graduate program and opened it to lay people. So I think one of the things on the issue of clericalism and gender, people, unfortunately, institutions hold on to it until they no longer can hold on to it. 
And what they do when they do that is they don't cultivate, cultivate lay leadership. It almost seems like if they cultivate lay leadership for taking over the institution, it looks like they've capitulated. They've given up somehow, rather than see this as an opportunity for a new form of collaboration. And, and, and to assume that lay people couldn't be as sensitive, if not even more sensitive to the charism of the order, I, I think is misplaced. There's a lot of transition period. Ronald Heifetz wrote one of the best books I've ever read on management, um, yeah, Leadership Without Easy Answers. But he talked about a holding period. Every great leader has to have a, a understand that it takes time for people to adjust to change. It takes time. And I think it's going to come, like it or not, simply from the demographics of religious orders. Now, I would wish that religious orders, my own order, if I may say it, was founded to develop lay leadership. That's what the Marianists were about. And I think the more that religious orders do that, in fact, isn't that what the institutions are for? Why shouldn't it also apply to administrative positions? Schluss. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks to you both. I'll re-enter here. So I'm hearing some feedback, I hope hope not everybody is. So I want to encourage people to ask questions, please, through the chat. We have some questions so far, but not all that, that many. So questions both for Jim and for Kathy. Um, let me begin, Jim, with one question we do have, and it's precisely what you were just talking about, namely whether we're ready for that transition to lay leadership. The, the question is, uh, how to prepare for that transition. So you suggest that some institutions might be quite loath to prepare. How do we though prepare? How do you prepare boards, for example? So uh, you know, it might be longstanding tradition at some institutions to hire a religious for the role of president. At some institutions like in Notre Dame and at Kings, it's still in the bylaws stipulated that there must be a religious as president it might not be in the bylaws at some institutions, but nonetheless, it's longstanding tradition. How do you prepare the board for that 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 transition from religious leadership to lay leadership? Um, before I answer that question, which is really good, let me say one other thing. And I've sensed this in many universities: when a faculty member, a full-time faculty member, becomes a department chair and then maybe goes on and becomes dean or a director of a center and so on. Often a kind of gap opens where they say, these are the people, they've gone over to the other side. I don't want to over -dramatic, uh, dramatize this whole thing, but you know, this is like, these are the administrators, they don't. And I think there's this kind of bias that I have experienced with a lot of faculty that they, they, have, they have relinquished their, their intellectual life. I found as provost, my intellectual life was more stimulated and more challenged than I ever did as a professor of theology because I had to think of a lot more things. So that's one background thing is there's, there's a, there's a built-in kind of bias in too many faculty that administrators go for money and power and they've given up on the intellectual life. That's putting it too bluntly, of course. The other side of the coin, however, is I, I have spent my years at Dayton I don't do it here at the University of Southern California, it, talking to people, lay people who showed a lot of talent, men and women, to prepare for administration. And when they were offered the possibility of moving into a position, and I felt this would be good, I encouraged them. And a lot of times there was reluctance for various reasons. So it's, it's, this, is not, this is not rocket science or, I made that mistake in a homily. I said something, I don't remember the homily, but I said, this is, this is not rocket science. And after, as I was greeting people when they left, one engineer came up to me and said, Father, rocket science is very simple. Rockets are simple. The problem is rocket engineering, getting the rocket to go where it's supposed to go. So I, I, I said rocket engineering, but getting them in positions and supporting them, continuing to mentor, 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 mentor not become so preoccupied with your own, you know, 
tenure review thing and so on and so forth. Well, you have tenure, you can do a lot more after you have tenure, but mentoring I think is one of the things that I have found to be the richest. Encourage people to do that. There might be somebody who can behind the scenes talk to the president, if the president is still a member of the religious order. A lot of what a religious order president says or kind of communicates, uh, he or she can kind of give the indication this is the way it's gonna be. If they gave signals otherwise, that would be helpful. And I think board members, the president can have a key role in that with board members. Talk about that. Because I think board members typically, given my description of them, I hope it's not unfair, but they might typically associate the Catholic mission of the institution with a member of the order and be more fearful that if, if a lay person comes, we're gonna lose something rather than we will have something that's different and it might also be a new thing that would be very good. You just gotta keep talking those things. Who controls the discourse? I think the president has a role to play and so do others in the institution. Kathy, did you wanna speak to that as well? Um, I, think, I think Jim said it very well, but I think the mentoring question, um, mentor, 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 I, I, I think too that um, it's important that, that the, the younger members of the religious congregation can be mentored by lay people as well. Um, that it's not, I think sometimes we, there's a lay leader announced, the first lay president of, of whatever, and there's a sense, well, that it's somehow crossed the line and that there will never be another president of um, the particular institution who's a member of the congregation. And that's not necessarily true. I think that, um, yeah, much of what Jim said about the way we can be made to understand whether we're faculty members or board members or students even, that this is not, um, that we're all in this together and that it is possible to translate that that charism. And I think too, I received a comment in the chat um, about Catholic healthcare. And you know, maybe that's something else we need to think about how Catholic health healthcare systems um, have moved forward under lay leadership. Is there an instruction there for those of us in higher education? Again, they were a little bit ahead of us. Um, are there models there that we could look at? Thank you. Uh, there's another related question, and now there's a cluster of questions coming to me, so thank you to everybody. Related question about uh, fundraising, um, namely whether uh, you know, fundraising might, might suffer with this transition from religious to lay president. So what are the implications for institutions of that transition? Uh, I think for certain Catholics, it could. I mean, there are Catholics who, who picture philanthropy as a spiritual exercise and what could be more spiritual than giving to a, a sister or a priest or a brother, you know? Um, on the other hand, I think fundraising ultimately is about a vision, a vision of academic excellence and distinctiveness. And I had the privilege of having the senior vice president of development who in one campaign raised $3 billion here recently uh, to be on my board of trustees. I got to know him. He mentored me when I was really wobbly and trying to get started and all of this, figuring out how I was going to do this because I had no blueprint. Um, but uh, he said very simply, put before donors something of high excellence and distinctiveness. And let them see that high excellence coupled with distinctiveness is competitive because too many Catholic universities that are well endowed are trying to compete with places that, that don't have a religious distinctiveness. And that's dangerous. That's dangerous. So I would say fundraising, yeah, it could with certain Catholics, but there are a lot of people out there. I've raised thousands and thousands of dollars from Jews and Muslims. Because I could say, here's what's needed. This is part of my tradition. It's part of the common good. Do you want to contribute to this? And so it, 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 it's the time you take to talk to the people. If you come in and start with an ask, you're dead in the water. You need to cultivate a really, I've had people, I have, I have Trump supporters 
who are good friends. I can talk even politics with them. They're not nutso. But, and they had a certain vision of Catholicism. But over a period of time, a couple of years, they could see what I was talking about and they could identify with it and support it. So it's face time, it takes time. Um, I think ultimately, whether you're a lay or religious, is is not critically important with all donors, only with a handful. I would just add that it's a constituency we haven't mentioned yet are the alumni of a particular place who are big uh, fundraising supporters. And for them, um, again, they're a group that have to be brought along in the way that other constituencies within a university do to show that just because uh, the president might not be a member of the congregation in the way it was when they attended the place. Um, that, that that mission is and the charism is is safe. It's been entrusted. So uh, how do you bring alumni along is something that, that we should be thinking about for the fundraising question in particular. I have a question about how to make Catholic institutions more distinctive. And I do want to come to that. But here's a somewhat provocative question. Uh, what do you think about the fact that some Catholic colleges are now um, hiring non-Catholics to be president? Is that a trend that, I don't know if trend is too strong. Is that a trend, I'll use the term, that's worrisome or um, what's your reaction to that? The hiring of non-Catholics as presidents of Catholic institutions? Well, there are some Catholics I wouldn't hire as presidents of Catholic institutions. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I think, I think frankly, it's irrelevant. I think all things being equal, it makes sense that the person be a Catholic. But that includes what I was saying, some grasp of the mission that's distinctive. There are Catholics who go into presidencies that don't that really don't understand the mission of the institution. They think of it primarily in commercial terms or financial terms or whatever. So I think generally it makes sense, but there's, there's also the important qualification of a grasp, an internal grasp of the mission. You know as well as I, uh, Bernard, that you could have a, uh, a Buddhist who is a scholar of Catholicism and do a better job than a number of Catholics who are studying Catholicism. So I mean, there's complexities here. Their complexities. So I would say all things being equal, it makes sense that it be a, a Catholic, but that to me is not the only criterion. Good question about distinctiveness. This is about what uh, faculty can be um, encouraged to do. So how can faculty be encouraged to do the, the research and intellectual white life of the college or university in ways that facilitate and challenge the mission of the Catholic Church I'll build on that, piggyback a little bit, in ways that would would um, lead the institution to have that distinctiveness, Jim, that you've been talking about. So how do you encourage faculty to do such work? Um, I can give a couple of examples of, of what we did at Dayton, which I thought were wonderful. And one of them is the transformation of the School of Engineering in collaboration with the sciences, both biology and physics, on issues of sustainability and environment. That drew a multi-million dollar endowment and it's beginning to be able to hire within it as a center um, endowed professorships. It's very impressive. It's very impressive. So that's that's one kind of a thing. I think for literature, for we had we had an English department for a number of years that worked with a committee that hosted Christianity and literature. You know, that kind of conversation and discussion. At the Institute, we ran the first uh, Catholic literary imagination, and that's gone on to different campuses now every two years, so on. But these things, th there are multiple ways of doing it. Think, think of what you could do with a school of business if you had a couple of people in various dimensions of a business, not just marketing. Marketing would be a field day in some ways, but also in finance uh, and so on. We're, where there would be uh, seminars for them. And, and you have to get, I remember faculty saying to me, are you, are you telling me that what uh, Pius XII said about this, now I have to teach? I said, no, I'm not telling you that. What I'm saying is try to understand the urgent moral questions 
see if you can see them as important and then realize the extent to which a number of those urgent moral questions run parallel to your syllabus, but they don't intersect. It's not that you don't teach what you usually teach, what they usually teach in is don't get in trouble with the law. It's like, like business ethics, that's what it is, or engineering ethics, whether you're a believer or not, a Jew or Muslim, your engineering ethics is usually uh, don't get in trouble with law, stay legal, but it rarely roots itself in a religious tradition, which has got much more power. And to do it through a conversation it takes a lot of face time, folks, it takes a lot of face time. I was really blessed that the university allowed me to work at that. And I was able to raise money from Lilly Endowment and a number of other places to be able to support these kind of efforts. They pay off in the long term, but they're hard work. I'll just add, Bernard, that we have an initiative uh, at Notre Dame that uh, related to the revision of the core curriculum, which we did a few years ago. And we replaced, uh, students now have the option to replace what was a second philosophy requirement with a course that's labeled uh, CAD, Catholicism and the Disciplines. And these are courses that engage with Catholicism uh, and according to several criteria, um, one of which is readings from scripture, the Catholic tradition on the syllabus um, uh, and a requirement for the student to engage a faith or normative question to uh, be able to do that. And I'm actually the chair of that subcommittee on the curriculum and it it is not easy as jim said um we we have some we have wonderful courses we have courses from uh the business school many in finance and, and accounting and marketing they that have, that has been uh wonderful um the the previous chair of this committee is now the dean of our business school so his um support has helped a great deal um, some of us, I know uh, John McGreevy is in the audience. He teaches a course on global Catholicism. So that became a CAD course. My course has become a CAD course. There's lots of courses in the history department. Um, it's, a, it's tougher with this in the sciences. And I can tell you as chair, I, I'm trying to cultivate that. Um, not for a lack of interest. It's just, uh, it's, it's at this point, uh, we don't, the university doesn't offer incentives for faculty to uh, develop these new courses. And that's something we're trying to encourage because we all have our courses that we teach. And it, it, even, even my courses, which lend themselves very well, most of them to the CAD requirement, do have to be revisioned in a way. And so it takes commitment. And uh, what incentives can we offer faculty to do that um, in the way of um, course reductions or additional support or whatever. But that is, it is a model that I'm, it's still, it's, it's very early um, and it's, it's gonna take a while and it requires a lot of work and a lot of institutional investment. Uh, but it is very gratifying, particularly those who teach it. And the students, the students really enjoy these courses as well. In fact, the, I, I mentioned this assignment that I mentioned about Land Lakes. I teach a course called Notre Dame in America. Um, and the final assignment is, um, do we need uh, a new Land O'Lakes statement and why? And that's their way that they engage their faith in normative question. That grew out of the CAD requirement directly. Let me add one other point where there is resistance um, and makes it difficult, uh, but not impossible. And it all hangs on the depth of the dedication to the mission. And that's simply this. There are a number of faculty that understandably uh, see as the criteria for their advancement publication and refereed journals, all right? And if you start writing a different kind of vision when it comes to economics or engineering, there are any number of the major journals, the prestigious ones that will look askance at what you're doing. You're writing outside the lines of the discipline. You're doing it in a different way. And you know, as long as you have some type of pecking order in the academic world of what journals count and what don't, you, you run into that kind of a problem and um, it's not easy to negotiate. Um, and, and the other thing is the danger, the opposite danger is that if you start emphasizing the distinctive mission in such a way that it gets soft in terms of academic rigor, rather than increasing what you need to think about rigorously, that's a problem as well. 
Uh, I think Harry has a question, but we have a few other questions too. Some about boards and one about advice for less wealthy institutions. Harry, though, you're unmuted if you'd like to ask your question. I'll be brief. As everybody knows, this year has been very important the issue of, of diversity, you know, and hiring and diversity in higher education, especially in light of the events of the past nine months. And, and, and you know, and Jim and I, we, we've talked about this too, this issue of, of diversity and how important it is in higher education. But at the same time, you want to uh, do diversity through mission. So could you just briefly maybe touch on that a little bit, you know, the, the problems of that, the complexity of that, and the importance of that, and how we can we can work together in those areas? Yeah, a good question. My, my mantra is diversity within a common mission. Diversity within a common mission. If diversity is a, cri a standalone criterion, it's only a matter of time before you dilute a lot. So on the other hand, if your mission is narrow, then you have another problem. So it's a tension between, on the one hand, being able to spot diversity that really supports a mission that, for example, if it's men or women, minorities, people of different religions, I have found people of some different religions coming to the faculty and with a perspective of faith, understanding aspects of Catholicism that Catholics don't understand. I mean, it's really very striking. So even though I say a common mission, it does not exclude people of different faiths, um, uh, people who might have no faith, but are open. I said before, they're not pissy, they're open. That You can work with that. And But I think if you don't pay attention to that, what happens then is somebody that has the highest academic credentials according to referee journals becomes always the preferred candidate, that's a mistake. Or someone who's a minority and that's all, and that's, or someone who's a woman and that's all. These are all too narrow criteria. They can't be disregarded, but they have to be carefully blended within a context of a whole mission that's well articulated. I would just add that the Catholic uh, mission is is so capacious and there are elements within that tradition that we can lift up. And I know I've thought very seriously about this uh, as director of the Krishwa Center since uh, after the murder of George Floyd this summer, we instituted a new uh, research grant that would um, support research on black Catholics. I redid one of the courses I taught last fall to incorporate the story of Thea Bowman. And that has led to um, an initiative that, that uh, we're building on um, this spring, not the Kushwa Center, the, um, the university is building on this spring. Um, I know uh, my Dean has asked me to explore possibilities for partnering with Xavier University in New Orleans, um, wonderful college and again a way that there's a lot that we can do together uh, to amplify this so I, I think we need to commit to it and to th always ask ourselves um, how can how can we do better and I've been doing that quite a bit of that as a, a scholar and a teacher um, over the last nine months but I think it's it, it's there um, uh, it's within the tradition that we can we can do both mm -hmm. thanks let me get to these questions on, on uh, boards. So I'm gonna to crunch together a few here. And Jim, you spoke to these questions to some extent already. So uh, should uh, faculty, students and staff have their own representatives on boards? Should Catholic colleges make it a point to invite non-wealthy alumni and alumni to serve on boards? And should faculty leaders likewise serve on boards? So presumably uh, leaders in faculty governance, let's say. So it's all about representation on, on boards from within institutions and what types of, of board members you'd have from, from beyond the institution. You both spoke to this question to some extent, but these, these questioners would like to hear a little bit more. Well, it, in principle, no objection. In principle, what's going on at the local institution could make a big difference. So for example, if there's a process where the faculty elect a group, they're unionized and there's hostility between the administration and the faculty, 
and have that person on the board, that's going to present some real difficulties. You might say, well, it could also inform the board for the first time. Well, there are a lot of ways to do that. I, 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 but I find it very difficult. To, I, I remember I said at the beginning, no generalization is worth a damn, including this one. And I find it so institution specific as to how to do it. I think having that person, having people like that automatically on the board might or might not be a good idea. I think it depends on what's going on at the institution and so on. There are other ways you can do it too. You can get board members around to these people and have them sit down and talk with representatives of the faculty and so on. They don't have to be on the board. I mean, if they attended more board meetings, they'd probably decide, I don't think I wanna be on the board meeting. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the thing I didn't mention to you that, that uh, I have noticed at a couple of institutions is uh, just if I can throw this in out, I've thought of it, is mission. Very often, the longest discussions at the board meetings are on finance, on um, buildings, stuff like that, and not opportunities for board education and mission education. That almost always becomes a kind of something you could do pretty quickly, or you guys take care of that, or something like that. That's, I'm just adding that as a writer. I wanted to say that before, but I forgot. I want airtime. I want airtime at the board. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll just say, um, at, in the time I've been on the University of Scranton's board, I've just been, obviously I loved my alma mater before, but I've been so um, heartened by the commitment to the mission. And I am on the mission committee, Jim, and uh, it is, it's taken very seriously by, um, by everyone. We do spend uh, quite a bit of time on it. But as far as the question, I mean, yes, more non-wealthy people. It's it's fine for me to say, uh, but yes, invite more non-wealthy people on board. Think about what they can give in, time, in terms of their perspective, in terms of their talents. But again, I know the realities. Um, you know, I, I know that. Uh, so I, I think that's, that's tough. There's a balance. And I think that's um, great things for, for university presidents to consider. What is that? What is that mix? Um, and how can we make room for an, more representation on the board while still recognizing the importance of having the, the corporate representatives on the board? As we say, no margin, no mission. Yep. That phrase um, has come quite a bit. Yeah, I have yeah. Some, some questions you know, about less wealthy institutions uh, you know, that would have trouble incentivizing, for example, the faculty research to make the institution distinctive. Uh, so would, would you speak to the effects of the pandemic on the very survival of some Catholic colleges and universities? So uh, you know, one or two places have shuddered or are near shuddering. A lot of institutions will be, will be uh, you know, suffering from the financial effects of the pandemic for years to come. Some of our institutions will not be so much, others certainly will. So uh, you know, I've got a few questions here. So one has to do with uh, you know, the, the right sizing of the faculty and whether at some institutions, the right move at the moment is to suspend tenure. Um, you know, this question of, of you know, who should be on the boards is relevant here as well. If these institutions are, are really looking for financial support in, in order to keep the doors open. So can you speak a little bit to uh, the uh, relevance of the pandemic to our question today? Uh, on financial exigency problems. Um, when I was provost, I closed two academic departments. That's difficult. That's extremely difficult to do, a lot of pushback. The problem in both cases were for them to really be competitive. They were mediocre and to make them competitive would require a huge infusion of money and we didn't have it. So um, there were some transfers I could make internally and so on. Uh, for those places that are in financial trouble and depend primarily on, on tuition, and the difficulty that they face themselves in and the sacrifices that they make. I can only take my hat off uh, how they do it. I could be hard-nosed and quote John Tracy Ellis and say, yep, 
the, we had too many of them, a lot of them mediocre. We should close them down. We should just go for excellence. Um, the other side of the coin is I know a number of places with a fraction of a major endowment that some of our universities have that reach a population nobody else reaches and does terrific work with them. So I don't have the crystal ball. And as I said at the beginning, I, I, I'm hesitant to make a generalization. I'd want to, I'd be looking for a president who could realistically bring that place out of near bankruptcy and retain a Catholic distinctiveness. You know, in the long run, they might really be able to get up to a higher speed. It's possible to turn around an institution, but that's why I said before, you better start thinking about 25 years. To try to change the culture of an institution is not easy. It's not easy. And, 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 and I'm not saying from bad to good, I'm saying from good to better. You know, that, that takes a lot of time and, and you get a lot of pushback. You really do. Uh, and, and if your skin is not thick enough, um, but not so thick that you can't listen, then I think you can do something. Other than that, I don't know what to say for the places that are on hanging by their fingernails. Man, that's tough. That is tough. That's a tough question. I don't know, maybe Kathy can solve it. <laughs> no, it's, um, I, I think about it uh, a lot. I mean, as COVID has just accelerated uh, crisis, many places we're already headed to. Um, I do think, as I said, uh, being at a wealthy institution, I, I think there are, there's, there's more that the wealthier institutions can do. And I wholeheartedly support what you said, Jim, about places that, um, yeah, Ellis might have dismissed as mediocre, but are still doing vital work. Oh. Uh, so I, I think that's part of the creativity we need and the vision for um, for university leaders. Uh, I think you know many places don't just need a visionary, one visionary president, they need a visionary president and then another visionary president after him or her. Um, this is the long haul. I just wanna lift up a comment from Tina Holland who I don't know, but uh, she says a university president who's intentional about the mix of trustees she recruits. Wealth, wisdom, work, and wow, all need to be represented. Um, I think that's fantastic. Um, that's in reference to the composition of the board of trustees. Um, but yes, I think this is, we have some very challenging times ahead and I think it's time. It's why I started with the, the Malloy comment, which is uh, much less, my, no, not known at all compared to something like Ellis, but but she wasn't, Ellis was, what Ellis was saying is we're mediocre now, let's shut down. What Malloy was saying, how can we not get to the point where we're all mediocre? So I think that's a more helpful formulation. What do we, how do we look ahead? How do we think creatively? Thank you both very much. We're just about at five o'clock and that seems like a a good point on which to end. I've seen some questions in the chat. Where will this video be posted? It'll be posted on the McGowan Center's YouTube page and Facebook page. And because I have all your emails, I will send you all links to the recording and you'll probably receive further emails from me as well. Thank you everyone for joining us. And again, thanks in particular to Father Haft and to uh, Professor Cummings for all you had to share with us this, this uh, afternoon into evening. So there are many more events to come if people wanna learn more about other events uh, hosted by the McGowan Center or other events in the Catholic Higher Education and Catholic in Light of Catholic Social Thought series. Um, well, look at my email and follow the links. So uh, I'll hope that you'll join us in the future. Thanks again. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.